And welcome back. You survived the uh, weekend here. We had a break on Friday. Hope you had some fun over the weekend. We're finishing up chapter 24. This is part three of 24, Enolites and Enols. So homework nine will be due tonight. Quiz seven is due Tuesday. Uh, make sure you uh, get that off of Learning Suite and use the PDF. Use the printed PDF there. Do your work on that and then upload that. And then Chapter 25 starting today. That's the amines. And look at this. Uh, test 3 <laughs> will start this Friday, July 31st. Uh, chapters 23 through 25. So that is our um, chapter here on the enols, enolates that we're just finishing up. And then the amines. So those uh, three chapters, yeah, that came up really quick. Less than two weeks, I think, we had to do on that. But that means, what, we just have test four and then the final coming up. So we're really uh, moving along here. Let's start with a review of the material from last time. Moving over to the sideboard here. If you want to pause your video and try these problems, feel free. And we are back. Let's see what the answers are. So... Sodium hydroxide at higher temperature with an aldehyde. So we're going to get, yeah, the aldol condensation product. And I try to be very clear about that, higher temperatures. The book kind of mixes that up in a couple spots, and we need to be very clear. If you have the higher temperature, you can eliminate water and form what's called the aldol condensation product. Now, that's contrasted with this conditions, right? So we have five degrees here with another aldehyde. And there we're going to get, what, the aldol product, okay? Self-condensation of that aldehyde with itself. And at the lower temperature, we stop at the uh, beta hydroxy uh, aldehyde product there. And then we have the Claisen reaction here, which is with methyl acetate. And the base corresponds to the ester. And then we have to acidify. Remember, in the intermediate, there's the beta keto uh, enolate, because the pKa is 10 there. That's a driving force for the reaction. You need to have at least two alpha hydrogens on your nucleophilic component for the Claisen condensation. And it gives a different product. It gives the beta keto ester product. Esters and aldehydes react differently. This is the aldol domain. This is the uh, Claisen and Dieckmann <laughs> domain comes out of the mechanism. You should be able to see that and use the mechanism to help you keep track of that and remember that. So here we have an intramolecular example here where we have, what, the uh, enolate of one of them form, then condensing here, c count the carbons, one, two, three, five, six. So yeah, it'll be the six-membered ring where the uh, beta keto one was the electrophile and your nucleophile is the one that's still an ester, okay? So that bond right there we just made. Those look kind of funny, but if you do enough of those problems, they're not uh, too bad. Now, this one's a mixed clays, and we would say uh, there's only one spot to form the enolate, and that's right here. And then it's an intramolecular variation. Now, that can polymerize and do an intermolecular reaction. We won't worry about that. If you see the formation possibility of a five- or six-membered ring, there are ways to uh, do it under slightly dilute conditions, and it will always give uh, that type of intramolecular example. So here would be our tetrahedral intermediate, if you want to consider the mechanism. Now, don't do this too often unless you really know what you're doing there. Uh, it's not directly displacing the methoxide, right? It's going via the tetrahedral intermediate, and then it's coming back down, okay? So make sure you're, you're clear about that. But I'll give uh, this product. Uh, after we quench with acid, the pKa of that uh, beta dicarbonyl compound will be very low, around 10 or so. So that will be your product there. And then we have a synthesis pro uh, problem right here. We have the malonic ester. Don't forget about these reactions. And if we form the enolate there, we can react with an electrophile, primary or secondary, very good. And then what? Heat and acid does what? It forms the malonic acid, hydrolyzes the two esters. That's from the previous section, right? The carboxylic acid derivative section. And then what? Decarboxylation. 
So we get the carboxylic acid, and these two carbons come from malinate, and then the other carbons on here came from the electrophile, which is the allyl bromide in that case. So how do you do on that? Keeping track of all these reactions is uh, important. Make sure you're cued by the conditions and the structure of the substrate. Now let's look at this intramolecular example here, a little more detail, show a couple more examples of that. This can be a trickier type of problem because there's a lot of different places that you can form enolates and often you have multiple carbonyls. You're not sure which one is going to be the electrophile. So let's see in this case, we have this one. We have one, two, three, and an ester. And we ended up with this last time, I think, and we analyzed where our nucleophile was gonna be. We said right there, right, adding here. Now all the other combinations are not productive. They're forming, the enolate can form here or here, but if you do the reaction with the carbonyl next door, those are too small of a ring. So the size ring here is gonna be one, two, three, four, five. And then after quenching with acid, I think we got to this product right here. It's similar to the one we just did on those review problems, right? But here it's a little harder to see uh, which combinations we're gonna have. How about this one? Let's have a aromatic group here with a methyl ester again and a ethyl ketone and similar conditions here, sodium methoxide and then acidify. So what about that one? Let's see. Well, the nice thing about this one, this can only be the electrophile. Okay, why? Because there's no alpha hydrogens to be the enolate. This one can be the electrophile and the nucleophile. Let's see, if it was a uh, nucleophile right here, that would be a one, two, three, four membered ring, okay? That would not be good. How about if the nucleophile was over here? One, two, four, five, six, ah, so that, probably is it, but again, this can this be the electrophile? Maybe condensing with itself, right? But like I said, these intramolecular examples are strain-free. You can easily have the conditions to do that, and so what does this product end up looking like? Yeah, you can go through the rest of the mechanism here and see that you're going to get uh, this product right here. Okay. So yeah, you have to rotate around here, right? Which you can do, of course. <laughs> Forming the enolate over here, this would be our productive enolate. Why? Because that's a six-membered ring, okay? And then tetrahedral intermediate, and then you initially form the enolate here in the product, and you have to quench that with the dilute acid. Okay, so hopefully that one's okay. Let's look at uh, maybe one more. I think you got the idea here. How about this one? Maybe this one's a little trickier because there's a lot of places where we can have the enolate and the electrophile. Let's see. <laughs> where would you predict on this one? Again, sodium methoxide, because we have the methyl ester and then dilute acid. What would it be? If you want to pause and try that, feel free. <laughs> Okay, and we're back. How did you, did you analyze this? Carbonyls can always be the electrophile component, right? Okay, and we have a long enough chain here. We could consider both of them being the electrophile, right? Let's see, here would be a nucleophile. Okay, if we could form that enolate, and certainly we are under these conditions. And let's see, then the electrophile would be over here. Ah, what size ring? One, two, four. Ah, I'd say no go. <laughs> There's gonna be other options here that are gonna be strain free. How about right here? We could have our nucleophile here. And where would that add? Oh, same issue, one, two, three, four. Again, a no-go, I'd say. How about over here? Hopefully this will do it. <laughs> Let's see, nucleophile, yeah, if we can form that. And certainly we can, what size ring might this be? Condensing again onto the electrophilic carbonyl. One, two, three, four, five, six, ah. Yeah, so that's probably our, our way to go there. So what would the ring look like here? 
after we do the uh, quenching and the workup and everything, look like this. <clears throat> okay. So, yeah, it looks symmetric. The two carbonyls end up looking the same, right? But we just condensed right there. We had this enolate over here on the ketone, condensed over here, tetrahedral intermediate kickoff methoxide, uh, deprotonate the intermediate product, and then we have to reprotonate it uh, to get the clays and condensation intramolecular example there. Okay, very good. Work some more problems like that. And you should be fine making a choice there of where the nucleophile is, where the electrophile might be. All right, <clears throat> let's look at another variation of enols and enolates. Now, before we saw this type of reaction, methyl magnesium bromide, or how about dimethyl cuprate? Where are these going to go? After quenching with water, let's see. The Grignard reagent is going to add here. Why? Because it's an aggressive reagent. That's a second row element, alkaline earth. So it's a very nucleophilic carbanionic reagent here. It's going to seek out the most positive position here to the reaction. After quenching with water, what will it look like? Yep. Okay. That would be your Grignard product adding at the carbonyl position. Now, if we add the cuprate, where did we add here? We didn't add at the carbonyl position. We added here, right? And why was that? Well, the copper reagents, because it's a late transmission metal, this is a more covalent type bond. They're less reactive. So it needs a resonance stabilized enolate intermediate. So it will add to the beta position here, alpha beta position. And then after quenching with water, we get the carbonyl back, okay? We call this one, four addition, added one, two, three, and then uh, we had the enolate here, and then we quenched at the alpha position. Here we call this, what, one, two addition, adding directly there. Well, we have some other weaker nucleophiles now. How about enolates, okay? Enolates, if we add this type of thing uh, under, sodium hydroxide conditions, we're going to form this enolate, okay? And where is it going to add if we add in an unsaturated ketone or aldehyde? Yeah, it's going to add right here. In fact, this is called the Michael reaction. Michael was a professor at Tufts University in the early 1900s, the first one to recognize this. He called it conjugate addition, okay? And actually, the cuprates came along later, okay? <laughs> Uh, so it kind of predates that. We've already shown you conjugate addition with the organometallic copper. The historic ones and the ones that we call conjugate addition or 1,4 additions are the weaker nucleophiles, the enolates. Okay, These are much stronger nucleophiles, carbanionic. So instead of adding at the 2 position here, it adds to the 4 position. And what do you end up getting? Yeah, you get this. And that's a highly functionalized molecule, isn't it? It's got the, uh, oh, I'm drawing malonate. I didn't mean malonate, although malonate will do it too. <laughs> uh, we just got methyl groups right there. Yep, okay. <laughs> that would be our uh, product here. In the case of Michael, these things are 80% yields or so. And uh, you can do these type of ones, or you can do the malonate ones, or the mixed ones. So you can do the acetoacetate ones, or let's get, get all of them up here, or the malonate ones, okay? So the diester ones, okay? Any of these enolates uh, will do this type of reactivity. And why is that? Because you get a, an enolate intermediate, not just an O minus, okay? Prefers to form the carbon-carbon bond right here at the beta position. Okay, so there's a bunch of those. Let's see a couple more quick ones. And these are all uh, weaker nucleophiles, you'd say. Even though some of them are charged, some are quite stabilized, you can add uh, to this type of unsaturated ketone with sodium cyanide in ethanol. Or you can add uh, 
ethyl sulfide. Okay. Now these are charged nucleophiles and everything, but these will all add here and enolate and then quench the enolate. So this one would give what the cyanide here and enolate. Oh, sorry, I flipped it around there. <laughs> Beta position, you get the cyanide. And how about this one? So here you get the sulfur acting as the nucleophile, right? That's where the negative charge is on the sodium ethyl sulfide. And so you get uh, this, this product. Okay. Again, we call this conjugate addition or 1,4 addition or Michael addition. <laughs> Any way you want to state it there. And these type of uh, nucleophiles give that, give that type of product. All right, let's combine this with a couple other ideas. So this was uh, Michael working on these simpler ones. Uh, but along came Robinson. And Robinson said, well, okay, we can do this. And here's one of the examples Robinson did. Let's take this molecule. What are we going to call that? Methyl vinyl ketone or MVK. I think I've called it that before. And let's treat it with hydroxide and water or, or pyridine and, and ethanol. Uh, it doesn't matter. You've got a quite acidic, right, pK of about 10 here. So what are we going to form with this? And then the product is going to look like this, right? You have that methyl group still there. And then you've got this tricarbonyl compound, okay? This is a methyl ketone over here. So at room temperature, that's what you can get in high yield. And uh, how does it work? Well, let's take our proton off here. And yeah, it's just forming the enolate of the dicarbonyl. And, and, and that's where it's going to start. Why? Because that's the most sick one. You've got an alpha methyl group here. You could be deprotonating over here. But that pK is about 20. This one's 10 again, right? And so this one, when it sees the MVK, can do the conjugate addition right there. And our intermediate would look like this. And yeah, don't don't lose carbons here. This, this is kind of a tricky thing. So methyl vinyl ketone, here's where the vinyl group was. And it's doing the conjugate addition, right? It's adding at the beta position of methyl vinyl ketone. Uh, this would be the, the one position there on, uh, uh, on, on the ketone. It's not adding there. So it's adding right here. Here's the bond we just made. And again, it's a resonance stabilized enolate. This enolate is not as good as this enolate, but what? We formed a carbon-carbon bond. So that can be okay. And then how do we get to the product? Well, if we're in water or uh, alcohol, right, then this comes down. Grab the proton off there. Yeah, the pK of this is 20, whereas water is 15. So that would be favored to give, uh, give this product right here. So that's really just a Michael edition of that, okay? Well, what uh, Robinson did now was he took this intermediate and he added more base and kept heating it. <laughs> and that's when the magic happens here. <laughs> so let's see. Here's what we just got from the Michael edition, right? But now let's keep adding base, okay? What do we have? Potassium uh, hydroxide here in water. And we're heating this thing, okay? So let's see, what's what can occur here? Well, let me give you the product and then we'll figure it out, okay? <laughs> and like I said, this I consider to be the trickiest mechanism in the whole course. So Chem 352, this is kind of a barometer of how well you're doing as a student. And I remember tracking this years ago. We looked through all the test results and, and final grades. And the A students, the ones that were in the A range, aced every time this Robinson mechanism. <laughs> and invariably, we always had some sort of Robinson <laughs> reaction on this test three. So 
this becomes a way to gauge your understanding. And, uh, and, and this mechanism looks pretty tricky at first, right? So how does this go? Well, you know, and, and plus it's combined with the conjugate addition right here, okay? So we could be talking about this, right? So you can take this thing, and you don't have to isolate the intermediate. You can just MVK and heat this thing up with base right from the get-go, and you're going to get that product over there, okay, the Robinson annulation product. Annulation meaning ring formation. So how is this going to work? Mechanistically, what are we looking at here? Well, you can kind of look at the mechanism backwards and say, okay, what's forming this? This is the new thing, right? This enone right here and this new ring. Yeah, it's a six-membered ring, okay? So all the principles we've been talking about kind of impinge on this. So what is this? Well, that will be what? An aldol condensation product. <laughs> so the Robinson is really a combination of Michael plus aldol. But you have to see the two separately and treat them separately mechanistically. And in tandem, these two reactions in the same conditions, right? Base, reversible conditions. It's a relatively a weak base compared to some of the other bases we've been using, right? Hydroxide or, or methoxide aren't nearly as strong as LDA or butyl lithium. So, uh, and then we're in water. So these are reversible conditions. But if you see the aldol condensation product right here, you begin to... Uh, conquer this problem. And keeping track of those two mechanisms within one reaction, I think, is the tricky part. And uh, so let's see. How do we start this out? Well, there's a couple places we can form enolates, right? But look at where it is. So where are we going to form an enolate? Well, right here. Well, we could form the enolate right here, right? That could be our nucleophile. Why are we forming it out here? In fact, that's the more substituted enolate. That, <laughs> there's more of that at equilibrium than there is of this. Okay, and then we have these guys that can be the electrophile. Okay, but look, we've had two spots over here that could be nucleophiles, right? <laughs> so uh, where are we going to go here? Well, you look at the product and you can begin to see. It's got to be this one adding to this, right? So let's go ahead and do that. If we do that step right here, what do we have? We've got the new ring forming. Look at that. Okay. Now, let's consider some of these other options. Well, that's a six-membered ring. Okay, that would be good. If we form, though, the nucleophile here and then add it here, what type of product would that be? Right, it would be a four-membered ring. That would be highly strained, so no. Okay. It is forming there, and there is some minor product from some of these other pathways that are found, but the Robinson annulation product over there is over 80% yield. Very efficient. So <laughs> there's a reason why, right? It's strain-free, six-membered ring. So this can form here. This can add here, but this strained ring will pop right back open, liberating 30, 40 kcals per mole. What about if we had the nucleophile here and then added it to here? Now that one doesn't look too bad, does it? How many? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six member ring. There's another six membered ring, right? Ah, but what would that look like? That would have uh, a bicyclic structure to it, right? It would have this structure. Two, three. Ah, uh, let's see <laughs> if I can do it real quick there. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> and now that type of a structure. Now we call that a bridge bicyclic structure. Okay. And this bridging here uh, makes it quite a bit more strained. The better product is the fused one where the, the two rings only share two carbons in common. Here, this type of bridging shares three carbons in common. And that induces a quite a bit of strain within the molecule. And plus the probability of this being able to reach around, pop the ketone up here of the enolate, and it has to be planarized, this whole part of the enolate, which makes this transition state leading to this type of ring. But indeed that is a six membered ring over here, which you know you might think is strain free, but because it's bridged, it's not as favorable as the uh, fused uh, bicyclic product. So let's go on from this guy. 
Uh, what do we need to do? We need to uh, protonate. We've got water or alcohol in there, right? So we'll get this intermediate. Now, that's not the end of the story, right? <laughs> so what do we need to do here? Yeah, we need to do the E1CB mechanism, which is more base here. And we are at high temperature, 100 degrees, 80 degrees C. Uh, and that's another indication you're going to the aldol condensation product. So that should fit in there with what we've been talking about. So what else do we need to do at this point? We need to form the enolate again right here. And once we do that, then we can complete the mechanism, the Robinson annulation. And so what do we need to do? Bring the electrons here, over here, and then kick off there. And I think that goes directly to the product. So how many total steps here? <laughs> well, you need to deprotonate here, one, add to MVK, that's two, protonate MVK, three to here, deprotonate to four, and then add, I guess, five steps, protonate six, form the enolate seven, and then do the E1CB. And why are we calling it that? E1, it's elimination, unimolecular, and it's the conjugate base. So reform that enolate right there and kick that off. That's the only way you can have hydroxide as a leaving group. We talked about that uh, last time at E1CB. It's not a concerted thing. Don't just show hydroxide directly attacking and having that come off. That's an incorrect mechanism. That's an E2 mechanism. Remember, we said that's a no-go. Why? Okay, Because that's a terrible leaving group. And that proton, if that carbonyl is not considered, that's not an acidic hydrogen. But if it's alpha to the carbonyl, it can form an enolate there. Yeah, then it can function as a leaving group. Okay, Via a different mechanism, E1CB. <laughs> okay, A little bit of a variation there. But again, that's the Robinson, and let me show you why it's important. Um, we can have all sorts of other variations here of the methyl vinyl ketone. Uh, it's normally got to be a ketone. Uh, why? Because at that point we can get a new enolate out here that has a five-membered ring that can do the condensation there. So it can be other variations of MVK. It can have, you know, other groups here or other groups here. So there are all sorts of variations of methyl vinyl ketone. Let me show you one here, application to the synthesis of uh, androgen, androstenone, which is one of the steroid hormone molecules. Uh, looks like this. All the steroids have these 6665 systems associated with them. They all come from cholesterol. The chain is clipped here. There's an angular methyl, angular methyl, and saturated. So that's androstenone. Um, yeah, I won't worry about the other stereo centers here. <laughs> They're there. Okay. Well, I guess I just did put them all in there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it's a chiral molecule and everything. Uh, it's made synthetically uh, right here. Okay. Let me show you the intermediate. <clears throat> Comes from this. Beta keto ester, which is a methyl ester right here. And it has the other rings here, the B, C, and the D ring on it. So this is just the A ring we're looking at. So I'm not drawing the rest of the uh, molecule there. But the reaction is to take this with uh, methyl vinyl ketone. And the conditions are sodium methoxide in methanol. So that's the Claisen conditions, right? Because we have an ester here, okay? So, you know, that base, and we have our hydrogen here that can get things started. So you can go through the mechanisms, and we need heat, okay? So what are we going to do? We're going to do the enolate here, conjugate addition right here. I'll show you a little bit of the mechanism, okay? <laughs> Push the electrons up there. And then we're going to reform this enolate here, right? That'll be our nucleophile. And that'll come in here. And so what will the product look like? Let's see. It's this. <clears throat> you can get this in high yield. You've got the ester here. Don't worry about the stereochemistry on this. We've got the uh, A ring. Oh, 
Let's see. Did I mess this up? Yeah, I did. <laughs> oh, good. I can correct it easily enough here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's the A. No, no, no. Wait a minute. No, no. We need the B ring here, don't we? Sorry. <laughs> uh, this is the B ring. Sorry, we're forming the A ring. <laughs> Okay, we'll eventually get this straight, <laughs> and I'll verify it with Aaron that I'm doing the right thing here. Let's see. Let's uh, get the B-ring in there. Yeah, and that's what we had on there to begin with in our starting material. So, yeah, there was our ketone, part of the B-ring, and here was our uh, beta keto ester. Yeah, and we just made the A-ring there, okay? And so, yeah, we made that bond right there and that one right there. You see why the Robinson's complicated. Even I mess it up sometimes, but we <laughs> got to look through it. Okay. And there's a couple things that need to go on here, right, to finish this off. You have to reduce the methyl ester here to a primary alcohol, make the tosylate, and reduce that with LAH. You can uh, reduce primary leaving groups with LAH to uh, alkyls, to the methyl group, which is right here. Not showing you the rest of that, but this was how androstenone synthetically and a number of other steroids were made in the 50s and 60s. And some of the steroids, very hard to get from nature. And so this uh, Robinson annulation for the A-ring turns out to be a synthetic approach to that. But I think we got it straight now. Aaron, does this look good now? <laughs> She's kind of nodding her head. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's correct. We had the B ring already intact, and we just used the Robinson to do the A ring right there. Yeah, okay. Via the Michael and the Aldol, and that will give us the uh, product there. All right, let's uh, look at an application of some of this carbonyl chemistry as it relates to some important drugs. And how about aspirin first? So. Let's look at aspirin. We've shown you the structure before. It's got a benzoic acid core to it. It has a phenol that's part of an acetate ester. And it's a relatively simple molecule. It's considered to be a wonder drug. Treats so many conditions, fever and pain, uh, you know, moderate, um, but acute and chronic pain. Treats fever, lowers fever. Uh, it inhibits prostaglandin synthesis. That's its mechanism. How is it made? <laughs> well, it's made from benzene that you can get from coal tar. Now, we've got to get two groups on there, right? So let's see. The first group that we would get on there is Friedel Crafts. Okay. And there's a reaction we already know already. And that kind of looks funny, too, because uh, that's cumene, isopropyl benzene. That's aviation fuel. Um, but it's functionalizing it. You might say, well, is that going to become this here? No, this actually becomes phenol. <laughs> and this is a way to make phenol. This is a reaction we haven't covered. <laughs> it's a heterogeneous catalyst of, of uh, copper and iron under peroxide conditions. Then you acidify, and you get this oxidation event. Uh, there's a rearrangement here. You initially get a peroxy group at this benzylic position. This is a radical process. I don't expect you to know the mechanism. Uh, when it migrates over and the isopropyl com group comes off, it comes off as acetone. So this is a great industrial process where two important commodity chemicals are made from uh, one intermediate. This is the one we need to go on to aspirin. And the key event here is taking CO2 with base. Potassium hydroxide is going to form the phenolate. And then if we add here to uh, CO2, we can use the oxygen. But what is phenol here? We're right. It's a enolate, really. Okay. So forming the carbon-carbon bond can actually be more important there. So what do we get at that point? We get this. Okay. We get the CO2 and hydrogen there, okay? So we're putting on the benzoic acid onto the enolate. So that fits into this chapter. But again, this is the keto version of what? Phenol, and that tautomerizes right away to what? The phenol. Now, I'm showing what the... Uh, 
the ortho product only. You also get some para product here, but the ortho product is actually the major one. And you can kind of think about why the potassium can coordinate the CO2 and bring it in at that position. And plus you have two ortho positions as opposed to one para. So this actually turns out to be the major uh, product there. And then we can acidify and that will give us what? The benzoic acid, the phenol on there, okay? That's called salicylic acid. That's actually isolated also in the bark of the willow tree. Uh, in fact, that compound on its own has some anti-fever, anti-pain properties. The acetate version though of salicylic acid is aspirin, and this is the more bioavailable drug, why? Well, the pKa here is quite low, you have hydrogen bonding once you take this pKa off. This is a stabilized thing. And so um, in the stomach, uh, this can get protonated. And because it's so polar, it doesn't cross the, the uh, intestinal lining uh, membrane very well. It's not absorbed very well. And most of it just passes through the body if you're taking the drug orally. But if you make the acetate version, and we know how to do that. Let's just take acetic anhydride and pyridine, and in fact, we need to use excess for both of those. And what you get initially is this. You get the anhydride there, the benzoate, and the acetate ester of the phenol, okay? So this intermediate with excess acetic anhydride uh, forms the anhydride here and the ester there. Well, which one's more reactive, the ester or the anhydride? Well, yeah, when you simply work it up with water, look at this, the anhydride will get hydrolyzed quickly. Why? Because there's a better leaving group here compared to phenol, okay? So you hydrolyze this one and you get the salicylic acid uh, product there. So that's a pretty uh, neat sequence of reactions it's done on ton scale worldwide. And again, aspirin's considered by the WHO and other uh, health agencies to be the wonder drug in that it's a simple compound, but it treats many conditions, including heart disease. There are some indications of heart disease, platelet ag aggregation, in fact, it inhibits that. So it leads to lowering of plaques that accumulate in the arteries around the heart. So it's not just pain and fever that aspirin can treat, it's that. However, <laughs> aspirin as a drug has some side effects and it has some toxicity. Now let's go up here to the overhead, Aaron. Move the uh, view there. We've mentioned you know, potency and toxicity before. Let's see if this focus is okay. <laughs> so yeah, we have the exhibition of poisons here to finish off our, our discussion here um, on chapter uh, 24. And you know, how, how potent are poisons or toxins. These compounds are from an exhibition that actually toured Europe and uh, North America, mainly in the Northeast, about 15 years ago. It was sponsored by the ACS and the European Chemical Society. And they actually had little vials and bottles of the amounts <laughs> that was the lethal dose that would kill the average person. Now that's a pretty morbid uh, exhibition. <laughs> But it serves a purpose to talk about the structures and properties of common substances, not just drugs. So yeah, there's a degree of toxicity and potency, right, that we need to talk about. All compounds, including water, have the potential to be toxic. In fact, thousands of people die every year from too much water. It's called drowning, right? <laughs> now that's a mechanical effect where the lungs become saturated with water, but you know, we're pointing out the toxicity of a benign compound like water. So here's some of the super toxic compounds. Here's dioxin, which comes out of the paper pulping process. It's a polycyclic structure with four chlorines on it. And it's the action of bleach onto sugars that come out of uh, wood pulp. And look how toxic that is. This is the LD50 value for to kill the average person. And that's in grams. That's what? That's one milligram, right? That's the amount you can barely see on the tip of your finger. That's enough to kill an average person that weighs 70, 80 kilos, right? In fact, dioxin was used by the Russians to poison 
the newly elected premier of Ukraine years ago. The guy survived, luckily, Lashenko. Maybe some of you heard about that. Uh, he didn't get enough to kill him, but it disfigured his face and he was sick for a long time. Uh, but yeah, that's just one milligram uh, is the lethal dose there, the LD50 uh, value. Then we got nicotine that people smoke all the time, right? Luckily, there's only a tiny amount per cigarette. It's nanogram amounts. You need 40 milligram amounts to, to kill yourself. That's the equivalent of smoking, I think, uh, 20 packs of cigarettes. So <laughs> you'd be hard pressed to do that. Uh, heroin. People die from heroin overdoses. Yeah, 50 migs will kill a person. Now, if you're a heroin addict and have become habituated to it and you tolerate it quite a bit, you'll need actually quite a bit more. And if you're buying your stuff on the black market, which all these addicts do, they don't always know what the potency is. Uh, so uh, being aware of that, but heroin is a very potent substance. White phosphorus used in warfare, uh, 70 migs will kill you. Arsenic, people are familiar with that, right? Well, that's 200 milligrams. Uh, a lot less potent than some of these other things. Here we got some other cyanide, of course. Phenol is in Lysol, the spray cleaner. Uh, don't spray that in your mouth and ingest too much because one gram can kill you. Now, how much does a gram look like? Well, that's like the tip of your whole index finger. Okay, you can see a gram amount. That's quite a bit. That's a load of material. Normally, you don't get exposed to that much from a spray from Lysol, but... There it is. Iodine, naphthalene is two benzene rings. Barbiturates, we've been talking about that. Elvis met his end with barbs, and he had to be taken quite a bit because the lethal dose is over uh, two grams. Opium, that's the latex material that oozes out of the poppy bulb plant. Uh, that's where we get um, morphine, which leads to heroin there. Very potent compounds. We'll talk about that more in chapter 25. So that's three grams. That's a lot of that opium material. And then some others here, uh, potassium chromate. We've been talking about chromate salts. Strychnine, which uh, Socrates met his end. Here's the strychnose tree. It kind of looks like an orange tree. These nuts here uh, have the strychnine toxin there. But yeah, four grams. That's a lot. Potassium dichromate, uh, tetrachloromethane, carbon tet, seven grams. And then here's the real common stuff that you know, we use all the time, but uh, they're not very toxic, right? So caffeine, you need 10 grams. That's like 400 cups of coffee or like, uh, what, uh, 500, 600 cans of Coke. <laughs> Average can of Coke has 20 milligrams. Maybe I didn't do my math right, but you have to drink quite a few cases of Coke to get even close to that. Uh, but that would lead to heart stimulation, and that would be the lethal dose uh, for most people. Formaldehyde, the embalming solution, uh, the, the biological tissue preservative agent. Oxalic acid, yeah, toxic. Benzene, a little bit of benzene got into Perrier water about 30 years ago. It ruined the company. Uh, the press reported, oh, there's one, two milligrams in Perrier water. Well, you need to get up to 20 grams in order to start having adverse effects. So it's a matter of dosage, right? But that's difficult to, to report to people. But yeah, 20 grams is a lot of benzene, okay? Diethyl ethers, toxic. Some others here, uh, acetaminophen, paracetamol. Uh, that, that's a common drug here, uh, 25 grams. Chloroform, iron salts, potassium chloride. And there's aspirin, 50, mil, 50 grams to kill the average person. Uh, you can overdose if you take the whole bottle, and there it is. Acetone, nail polish uh, remover. So a lot of solvents have toxicity. Ethylene glycol, uh, it, the antifreeze material here, they put in a uh, bright green dye here to differentiate it from water, and they put in a bitter-tasting compound called Bitrix to keep dogs and kids from drinking it because it kind of looks like Kool-Aid. And it's in the garage, and plus it has a sweet taste, which is beguiling, right? So you take a big swig of that, big mouthful of that, and if you swallow it, 100 grams isn't that much. That's uh, three or four cups. or No, three or four ounces. So it's like half a cup uh, can kill you. And then kitchen salt, there you go. <laughs> Your shaker of salt sitting on the table. 100 grams, though. You'd have to swallow uh, a lot there, and that would be 
That'd be a pretty miserable way to go. But anyway, uh, it's an awareness issue, right? As we learn about these materials and their properties, you should have some sense of the degree of how uh, dangerous they might be. Now, there's our aspirin story, the wonder drug. Hermann Kolbe came up with the synthesis I was just showing you on the board, uh, converting coal into this drug that treats all these conditions. And yeah, that's certainly a wonder drug. It's still considered the top most important drug by the WHO and other agencies because it is so cheap, available. Most people tolerate it very well. Some people are allergic to aspirin, though. Um, actually, the Frenchman, Charles Gerhardt, was the first one to actually make it. He used a different route that wasn't very efficient, but Colby uh, was able to do it. Like I said, salicylic acid is isolated from uh, the willow tree, the salix uh, family of plants. Um, this is okay as a drug on its own. In fact, the willow bark and the leaves were used historically for millennium by ancient people to treat different conditions. But it was after we made it more bioavailable and made it uh, in pure form that it actually was able to go there. And here's a big bioreactor, which allows for uh, uh, multiple kilo scale up to ton scale kind of thing. All right, now, um, these reactions we've been looking at, we just looked at the uh, enolate reaction with carbon dioxide. Here's an important step right here in glycolysis that we'll look in detail later on, converting glucose into pyruvate. That's the first step of metabolizing glucose to create ATP inside of cells. Glucose is the dietary energy molecule, the carbohydrate. Bring that into the body, it's absorbed into cells, and in the cytosol, it's converted into pyruvate. And a key step here is to recognize glucose has six carbons. It's this hemiacetal ring. Six carbons in glucose, how do you get down to three carbons in pyruvate? Well, it's right here. This molecule is fructose, and it undergoes a retroaldol reaction. You can't really see that yet. We'll need to look at the ring open version or acetal version of fructose. But then at that point, you have a ketone at the two position. And then you have the alpha beta position here between these two carbons. You can actually break that bond with an aldol lace. And if you look at it in the forward direction, you would take this uh, enolate right here, deprotonate, uh, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and then add that to glyceraldehyde phosphate, or GAP, DAP and GAP. <laughs> we'll see a lot of acronyms here in metabolism. But that enolate, adding to that aldehyde and then protonating, that is fructose. <laughs> so the reverse of this aldol reaction between these two gives us these two three carbon units, and they're both converted onto pyruvate. So we'll see that in metabolism and how that relates to those important processes in biochemistry. Now, another reaction here in the citric acid cycle. We're going to have acetyl-CoA coming out of pyruvate metabolism. And if we form the enolate there of acetyl-CoA, there's alpha hydrogens right there. That enolate adding to a ketone right there, that's an aldol-like reaction. That forms citrate. So this is why it's called the citric acid cycle, protonated form of citric acid. That then converts around this cyclic pathway, giving off CO2 and forming ATP. We'll see that later on as well. Uh, just one other quick thing to point out here, the reactions we've been learning concerning uh, the Claisen reaction. These are thioesters condensing with each other to form beta-keto thioester intermediates. That's completely analogous. In fact, it is a Claisen reaction. Okay, and this is converting butyrate into hexanoate and on up to the higher order sugars. There's some intervening steps, the reduction of the beta keto, but that's also uh, what we've been talking about. Okay, so that's more than enough, I think, wrapping up chapter 24. Let's take a break, and then we'll be back with the first part of 25. Very good.